What's up, Denver? Today, we are talking short-term rental data analytics, aka Airbnb. Got my co-host, Chelsea Scott. Chelsea, how's it going? Hey, Chris, great. I'm excited about today's show. We have literally one of the top experts in the country when it comes to short-term rental data and trends. He's the founder of AirDNA, which is the leading company when it comes to like analytics and trends in the short-term rental market. He's a short-term rental investor himself and happens to live in Denver. Scott Shafford. Scott, how are you? Really good. So happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, man. We're we're just very excited to have you here. Um, let's start off with just kind of some background in AirDNA, because I know it kind of blends your story into creating a really great company. Quite a few of our listeners are familiar with it. Uh, quite a few are not, but let's start with the story. Story, yeah. Happy to go back. About 10 years. Um, so I was at a corporate job for about 10 years and uh, had a new CFO come in and he didn't think I was worth anything. So he kicked me out, laid me off and I was unemployed. Uh, so I was looking to figure out a hustle like uh, like a lot of people and sort of stumbled into Airbnb as a way to make some extra income. Uh, my neighbor told me about Airbnb when I was going to go travel. He, you know, and I was looking up storage units. He said, hey, you know, don't go put your stuff in storage. Put it on Airbnb while you're traveling. And so I did that. And uh, and this was like 10 uh, 2012, 2000, so early yeah, on. 2012. Mm -hmm. And so I just took some photos of the iPhone, threw it online and had a booking within like, you know, an hour and uh, was pretty much fully booked while traveling through Southeast Asia back in 2013 for about three or four months. And so I got back, uh, couldn't find my dream job. And so sort of one day I was like, I need to make some extra cash in this one one apartment up uh, in Santa Monica was, you know, cash flowing like 3000 bucks a month for me. And I was like, well, if I could just do like 10 of those, then like who needs a real job? And so I started just assembling every four months or so, we just get another another one bedroom apartment, another one bedroom apartment. And they were all doing about 3000 bucks a month. So I sort of just had a beautiful hustle, uh, decided to forego the nine to five grind and sort of just keep building that portfolio. Um, but Santa Monica, you know, regulations came and uh, you know, it was one of the first places, it was the first place in the world to make short term rentals, absolutely illegal, no ifs, ands or buts about it. Um, but uh, so at that point in time, I realized I had to do something different. Uh, and I wouldn't think I knew well is data and analytics from my background in sort of corporate America. And I knew Airbnb really well. So I wrote an ebook called the Airbnb Experts Playbook, probably been downloaded over a million times now, and uh, started getting nerdy with the data. So my, uh, it's a good story. My dad's actually an engineer. So at the dining room table, I asked my dad to go and figure out if he could scrape Airbnb. I just learned what that word was. And he was like, yeah, I could probably figure it out. And so he got me all the data and I started figuring out what to do with it. Um, and so it was really sort of a cool story. Yeah, just me and my dad trying to figure out, you know, if we can get some data around this marketplace, which I knew was gonna be big. Uh, and it was a rental arbitrage opportunity that I, I understood early on, rent a place for 3,000 bucks a month, put it on Airbnb, run it for 8,000 bucks a month. Like it seemed pretty, like why is nobody talking about this at the moment? And it seems mm -hmm. like it's taken seven years for everybody else to start talking about it, but the opportunity has been there for a long time. Um, so. Yeah, man, just got started getting all the data together and started to figure out how to productize it, right? How to figure out how to tell people where to get the good markets, tell people what their competition was doing that was smarter than them. Like what is benchmarking look like for short-term rentals? What should your occupancy be? What should your ADR be? Really trying to think about Airbnbs like hotel properties and really trying to elevate the game of a somebody who stumbled into an Airbnb rental to like really think like a hospitality expert, right? So how to put some data behind decision-making and you know, I don't know, seven years later, you know, here we are, you know, with uh, tens of thousands of customers, uh, lots, lots of people, uh, 50,000 people visiting the site every month. Uh, and so it's, it's become a um, pretty you know, global thing. <laughs> and, you know, so it's been nice to be at the, at the forefront of it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I use it some, I click on, I'm nowhere near an expert or anything like that, but like the amount of data you have on there is just impressive and just keeping up to date with it. But Putting the shoes of like the average investor, average mom and pop investor, you know, not the hotels, not the institutions, average mom and, mom and pop investor, someone here in Denver or around the country, how do they use Air DNA to help them understand the short term rental market? Was it the first property in short term rental or I got a long term, I'm convert over? Like, where does Air DNA come into that data gathering and decision process? Yeah, totally. I mean, the hardest part about this business is the data accuracy, the data gathering, right? This data is in. Airbnb listings, uh, it's in Verbo listings, it's in private property manager information. So just be able to sort of piece all this data together and just understand what a property is actually earning as a short-term rental is like the hard problem that we solve and spend a ton of money trying to solve. And so, you know, what you do with that data, you know, is is we have this product market minder. It is like our go-to 
consumer beginner sort of app. Well, not it's not even a beginner app. Everybody's using it now. And so what, what it really helps you understand is you type in Denver, you can see all the zip codes, all the neighborhoods of Denver. You can easily in, you know, this map section compare like what's the ADR? What's the occupancy rate? How quickly is this market growing? And so you can sort of just subdivide Denver into the 50, you know, major, you know, neighborhoods, right? And so easily compare like what's up and coming, where are people charging a lot of money? Uh, and like, where is this like differential between like what a property cost versus how much is earning on Airbnb? We call this investability on our platform. And so we try to make Make it pretty simple, right? And to be able to say, hey, okay, here's every neighborhood in Denver. What's on the rise? What's uh, cheaper? Uh, where do we think homes are going to appreciate quick? Because you know these properties are making fifty thousand dollars a year on Airbnb, but you can buy it for three hundred k. Like this is a great investment. You know what we what we have seen a lot is like where the best vacation rental investments are, or where homes are appreciating at like an, an insane rate. So we, we do know that like investors getting a short term rentals and 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 they're and they're using our data to figure out where to go, <laughs> and homes get more expensive in those markets you know pretty quickly. And you think uh, that data helps drive like that market growth? Is there a Absolutely. correlation there? Absolutely, yeah. We're still doing some research with Redfin now. Uh, we're doing some with Zillow, and we're really studying like you know where we're pushing everybody to Joshua Tree, or we're pushing everybody uh, to some places in like Tennessee uh, or Destin, Florida. Like we see home appreciation rates that you know far exceed you know anything else, even in like that local region. Uh, it's because we can get all the details later, but like you know if you really think about what we think is an interesting trend is that you know residential real estate and commercial real estate are are merging right they're sort of blending you know if we could take a home now and you turn it into a hotel you know how do you value value that home differently right it's no longer just what the comps are and what people are willing to stay uh, to, to live there now it's like okay cool what can i actually make on this property as a real sort of commercial property and so that's the interesting thing we see happening is that people are actually paying premiums bidding up getting into bidding wars for properties that have you know predictable revenue or you know have revenue streams that are going to be uh, pretty substantial so we just see appreciation of those 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 houses in a lot of these markets yeah so h historically for for our um audience we we generally look at income properties which can just be like a single unit or a duplex or a fourplex and then they have a historic income stream is that a little bit different though if they're doing it on the short-term rental side so as opposed to like a long-term income property that's just had a, a single year lease um yep. are you collecting that data differently and seeing different trends there yeah we are i mean that's um you know with 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 the growth of this industry like you, you know when you're going to go buy a property most likely it's not going to be a current short-term rental property it's probably not going to be rented by a perfect property manager who's doing everything smart right and so it's there's not like a market rate of like what your revenue should be for a vacation rental it fluctuates a lot right did you decorate it from ikea or did you go to rent you know restoration hardware and decorate it mm -hmm. did you do perfect mm -hmm. distribution and revenue management yeah. so there's not really you can't just look at like what their rent role was and say that's what it should be even mm -hmm. and so what a lot of like what our tools are doing this one tool rentalizer specifically is saying you know hey based off the value of the house based on all the comps proximity size market direction like what should this place be earning uh, generally does, does that aggregation of data ever include hospitality do you ever factor in then so you have like these 20 homes in this one market and then they're going to produce these different numbers based on some of those factors whether mm. the you know the decor the location the um the town the neighborhood but then do you look at maybe what some of the hospitality industry is doing as well and like the hotels specifically? Yeah, yeah. specifically the hotels we, yeah. we don't really pull on the hotels um it makes make sense that you wouldn't just we, we don't pull in the yeah. hotels we, just, we, we do think it's different we do think it's there is probably some correlation there you know in this like sort of great year for vacation rentals this last 18 months like the hotels mm -hmm. become like not as much of a uh, competition yeah competition like yeah. how to price your property or like you know how to count that supply it's been you know the pandemic's been great for vacation rentals because everybody's trying to get out of crowded lobbies and and elevators and corridors yeah. and into you know swimming pools in your backyard that are private right? so yep. uh, you know we think of hotels you know less and less as competition especially as you get to two bedroom plus units where you know just the economics of you know being able to get six people in a two bedroom place isn't like something you can sort of compare versus a you know a 300 square foot hotel room yeah makes sense yeah so um, going back to just using AirDNA for investors, like you, you get this amazing bird's eye view of data and I'm sure, you know, all the other industry professionals, you know, what are just some general tips or, hey, you're a new investor in a short term rental, like what, what 
words of wisdom can you share with our audience? Sure. Um, I think, you know, th th I've used this term before, but I love it. And it sort of describes AirDNA well, which is, you know, I think the riches are in the niches. And, you know, short term rentals seem like a niche, but there's niches within the niche. Right. And where I've seen a lot of people with success is, you know, buying by hospitals and only buying by hospitals, right? Or only buying by college universities or only buying by, na you know, uh, national parks, right? Those are like three good ideas, by the way. Uh, and those, mm -hmm. those are really properties. There's not a lot of hotel supply. There's not a lot of competition. And you can sort of get really smart about how you're marketing, decorating all those properties uh, in a consistent way. Um, so that's, that's definitely interesting is think about where hotels aren't think about where there's demand drivers where it doesn't make sense to put up a hundred room hotel and think about where um where people you know want to right now the trend is everybody's trying to drive to go on their vacations and so all of these rural destinations these small little towns that nobody thought about now are like the hottest destinations in the u.s right and so i think it's the other thing to think about is what used to seem remote now is exactly like what people are looking for and so like the re more remote the more isolated you know, usually means better property values and you know is unique and people are really just looking for unique off the grid interesting places and so there's a lot of people just getting creative about you know um new locations new property types um and so that we call those unique stays it's the fastest growing segment of of short-term rentals and that's like you know the tp and that's like the yurts and that's the, oh yeah the tree houses like people love it right they want something memorable they don't go on a vacation they don't really want to go to the marriott anywhere they, they want to like make a new memory and you know you make a memory by staying in a tree house and and not at that you know hampton inn and so that's mm -hmm. sort of like the new trend we're seeing and you know what how people are choosing to travel these days um anything from like an operational standpoint because I think you, you had made a comment before you record that, you know, hey, yeah. step one is find the property that once you, you know, close on own, it's like it's a whole different world out there. Totally. Uh, and it's like, I don't know if you get any data from the operational standpoint, but what any tips you can give to those people from that? Yeah, from the next set layer perspective, down? yeah, you know, and it has been a little while since I've been in the game, like, you know, myself. But, you know, one of the tips uh, in my ebook was always more heads and beds, right? So, like, you know, bunk beds and just trying to figure out how many people to get in there. I know, Chelsea, I think you've got yeah. some properties. You're like, oh, no, that's going to be a disaster. And the wear and tear is going to be terrible. Yep. You know, for me, I was like, I, mean, I don't care for an extra couple thousand dollars a month. I'll, you know, I'll deal with wear and tear, right? Um, so that's what was always a key component. You know, people are looking to figure out what they're going to do at a home now. It used to be like they're just going to mm -hmm. go there and they're going to go explore the city. But now a lot of people are like, we're going to go here. We're going to hunker down here for like a whole week. Right. And so like all the activities and the games and like just making sure you got like Monopoly or whatever. Right. Yeah. You got yeah. Like bags in the back. You've got some like ladder ball. Like people just want to like, what am I going to do here for a week is like one of the easiest investments you can do. Yeah. And making things like child friendly is just another thing that people overlook. Right. Just like the simple investments and like the high chairs and the cribs and all the stuff I've already forgot about I had for my kids but you know all those <laughs> things are really cheap investments that just open up like your possibilities to a, you know a segment of people are willing to pay a nice premium yeah amenitizing the place like a hotel sort of yeah. you know giving them things to do and all the different services that you could usually call up room service and say hey I need you know I need a pack and play or something but now right. you can just do that um, to your own home yeah yeah it's a great investment add-on and then you know short-term rentals are complicated right there's all this revenue management stuff you you know most people aren't just listing on Airbnb and calling it a day you got to list on Verbo and maybe booking.com and create your own direct website and you know it in a lot of markets, Airbnb itself can still be successful, but that's just not the way of the future. You know, Google's got their vacation rental platform now. And so, you know, you do need to sort of tap into like, how am I going to get my property in front of every eyeball and every platform? Um, and so that's, you know, distribution is, is really important, revenue management. Do you have a rough idea as far as like, you know, put a short term rental on the market, like how many bookings from Airbnb, from Google, from Verbo, like is there a standard breakdown? Yeah, the, the, there there isn't because it, every geography is different. Uh, Denver's pretty more of an Airbnb market. Colorado is sort of a mixed bag. Like some of the vacation rental markets in like Vail and Breck are going to be you know mixed, fifty percent Verbo, fifty percent Airbnb. If you got a one bedroom place in downtown Denver, it's going to be ninety five percent Airbnb, 
plus uh, and 5% Verbo. So it depends on the size of the property, you know, how like high end the property is, where are people traveling from and to. California people love Airbnb, Florida people love Verbo. Like, I don't know why that, that happened. Really? People mm. from Texas are Verbo bookers. Uh, so it just really depends on the type of the property and the location okay. of the asset. So there's too many variables in there? Yeah. What about like, I mean, there's been so much excitement around short-term rentals for, I mean, years now. I got some people saying, oh, it's too hot. You know, it's not worth investing now. Other people like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. You know, ride the data, get cash flow, take the appreciation. I mean, is short-term rental markets in a bubble for a lack of better words? It's a great question. I get, I get it I, get <laughs> I know it you get it a lot because I get a Denver I, bubble all the time. So I get to ask I get you this question. Now. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, the only thing that, that really puts a damper on on short-term rentals is regulation, right? And that yeah. is the one thing to always keep an eye out. And where my investor friends are always getting into places where high density of vacation rentals, they own the HOA, they know the city council people, and they, they have like a lot of certainty that I can sort of put whatever, a good chunk and change in this market with a lot of certainty. Um, but what's happened during the pandemic is people just sort of seen Airbnb for the first time or traveled on Verbo for the first time. And like, what, what took me so long, right? And so new habits have been formed in the system and we don't see a lot of mm. people being really happy. We don't see them like really eager to go back to the hotel experience, right? So we, as long as the demand is there for the product, you know, there's going to be a lot of money to be had to individual entrepreneurs looking to get properties in the space. I don't think it's a bubble, um, but you know, the pandemic has created a bunch, you've put a bunch of stuff in flux. And one of those things is people aren't traveling internationally. They're all getting their car instead of planes still, and they're going to more remote destinations, right? And that's like, you know, check, check, check for vacation rentals to be able to fulfill that need. Um, and mm -hmm. so, but who knows two years from now, everybody wants to finally get to their Paris trip and nobody wants to go to, you know, the mountains anymore. Like nobody can say like what, what happens in a couple of years. Uh, the economics for vacation rentals are so strong right now and the optionality to go back to a long-term rental of like, Hey, you know, didn't work out or it got, you know, regulated or there's too much competition. Like, you know, there's always just optionality to go back to a more traditional, uh, investment. And that's one of the nice things about Airbnb. And we always, you know, look at to help clients buy a property. Say, hey, you want to go short-term rental? Awesome. That's plan A. Now if something changes, you know, HOA rules or regulatory rules, the yeah. plan B, long-term rental or medium-term rental, are you happy with it? But there's usually like, you know, one or two plan Bs and plan Cs in there. Yeah. What about um, from like a very high level overview? Um, because I've seen the headlines that Denver, Colorado is, you know, a, a top Airbnb market. Um, can you kind of give us a rundown as far as like just high level data as far as like how Denver, Colorado ranks or are there certain like, you know, parts of Colorado towns that really stick out into what's interesting to you? Because we have a lot of people that want to, they live in Denver, they want the mountain, the vacation on the mountains or vacation on somewhere else and they can offset it. That's always a big interest. Yeah. Or is another market just to return so much better? Like just from a high level, like what's, what's your 50,000 foot view right now in the markets? Uh, one point there is like typically wherever you want to travel yourself is going to be the worst investment place to go, right? Because everybody else has the same idea. I want to get a place in Breckenridge mm -hmm. and I want to go there, you know, one month out of the year, but like everybody else has that idea. And so that's like typically like don't buy like with your heart, where you want to live, where you see yourself traveling because Everybody else wants to go to that same place, and there's usually not a good deal to be had on a vacation rental. It's usually the, the the weird spots like Jefferson Park, right? You know, not a great spot right by downtown, but it's right by the stadium. It's right by the museums. It's right by like, a bunch of stuff, and properties are cheap, and people are making like a killing in that market, right? Because you don't want to really vacation yourself to Jefferson Park. Mm -hmm. But if you look at a map and you look at proximity to things, and you look at the price of the rental for a week, you're like, yeah, that sounds great, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's usually those little pockets that are sort of like adjacent to whatever that, you know, the, the ball stadium or to the museums or the zoo, uh, you know, that's where people are, are looking to book. And when people are booking Airbnbs and what's gonna happen when we get past this sort of, the, the, you know, the pandemic, you know, people are looking to get into the highest density areas for the cheapest price, right? They're trying to get away from the hotel and into an Airbnb. So, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity right now in the vacation rental markets. Colorado is a tough one uh, just because it's been historically such a big vacation rental market and there's been a lot of money flooding into it and the prices of homes are at a point where it's just 
there's better deals to be had. <laughs> I think yeah. just generally, um, we do this great blog and it's, it's actually really good information. It's the best place to invest in vacation rentals in the U S probably a lot of your readers have read it. Um, and that has some markets that I'm totally blanking on. Uh, so I don't want to misquote it, but like that are in, um, you know, sort of like Leadville areas or other places that aren't sort of like the primo uh, vacation rentals. Durango is really hot. Uh, things on that side of sort of Colorado are hot. Um, I don't look at Denver too much because I've just always thought it was sort of just like a, a regulatory, you know, mm. headache, hassle, oh, yeah. no go. Mm. Uh, I've heard some of my friends think there's a gray area. I haven't really explored it um, because there was some legal lawsuit overturned and they think it sort of put some things up. Uh, you know, upended some of those those rules that were in place. So I know some people are trying to figure out how to thread the needle in Denver, but I, I can't really mm-hmm. talk about it too, too in too, too much detail. Let them go first yeah. and figure it out anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm tired of being the trailblazer in space, yeah. One of the things I, I you know, I, I've heard this for years. I still see all the, you know, the YouTube ads, Facebook ads, you know, the, the Airbnb arbitrage, you know, go, go rent a place for a thousand bucks a month and Airbnb for 3000 bucks a month, whatever it is. Is that still like, I know years ago, especially when like you were doing it early on, like amazing opportunity. Is it still an amazing opportunity or is that compressed or have rules changed or how's that landscape look? So there's sort of like the, um, the, the honest answer is in highly regulated markets, rental arbitrage is a beautiful business. It's just an illegal business. <laughs> and so like, you know, and some people you're, I, and I was doing it in Santa Monica. I was like, Hey, they're not going to know who's going to find out. I can do this for 12 months. I can make a boatload of money by furnishing this place for cheap. And when somebody finds me cool, like I'm out in 30 days and go to the next place. So like, it just depends on like what your risk appetite is yeah. and like how much you're willing to accept. And in my place where I was like broke and had no other opportunity, I was like, cool. Like, you know, what are they going to do? Find me a thousand bucks? Like, well, it's worth the risk. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if you look at our rental arbitrage report, it's got like Charleston and Savannah and all these markets that are best place to invest is because it's the most illegal in place to like do this above board. Right. And outside of those markets, you know, it's, it's, it is harder to find, you know, a, a good margin there. And the reason is just because the demand has shifted away from multifamily, big units and highly dense metropolitan markets and into the more remote spots, right? Like people still, and with Delta variant coming back, we're seeing a lot of cancellations in cities. And so there's just a lot more cautious um, appetite to getting back to the city right now. And that's something that's more of the driver is just there's already enough stuff. Hotels are cheap. They're like dirt cheap in a lot of places. And so, you know, until hotels, raise their rates you know it's hard to figure out how to get a premium on a premium on your airbnb as well yeah and i think i saw um that some of the air dna data will let you look week by week as to the supply and the demand for properties so that's probably a good thing that renters can or owners can do is go on to air dna and see like well this week like maybe what should i charge um that that to me was a great benefit of um as an end user and as a landlord that i could go in and i could say well my place is open for the next four weeks so let's see what the competition's doing right now um and especially with things like delta variant coming in and changing it um that information could change week by week yeah so yeah Ab- absolutely that's... yeah and this is you know why our companies thrived in this years because when there's uncertainty and there's no predictability and yeah. there's no way to like benchmark versus last year or yeah. like you so you just really like the trends are changing so quickly and that's why you know a lot of these big property managers that used to just be like oh cool we're trending this like versus last year yeah. uh now it's just like uh, you know you need real time yeah, and, and we've business. actually gone in and changed our own metrics for our own rentals like in certain weeks when we have a, an open gap because we realize like wait a minute you know these two weeks aren't renting for whatever reason whether it's there's nothing going on in the city at that time or it's just an off-market season but i can go in now to air dna and say like well what is what is the market bearing right now and make that change and um and go from there and we've been doing that in the off season for for our, one of our properties cool. so I'm yeah so it's, yeah, it's super it. helpful yeah. uh-huh have you noticed any i don't know if you can pull this data between like self-managed airbnbs or property management airbnbs mm. are you able to pull data and see any trends on there um as far yeah, as we like, can we can actually yeah, we're doing a project run right now okay Ooh. if you can i don't know if you're able to peel back i think it was a sneak I peek mean, the, but the, that's the story is actually pretty positive for independent operators as they call them rental by owners in our in our space and that is um 
people generally are not happy with property management companies. They just yes. don't have the <laughs> same level of detail and care about your property, about your guests, right? Because you're one of a hundred, right? And it's it's what we see is just like guests are happier, that smart individual operators can make a boatload more than you know property managers. They don't have the time to spend on their revenue management. They don't have time to geek out on the AirDNA dashboard for every single property. They don't know all the different demand drivers that are sending people your way. They're not going to work on repeat guests to come back to your property. So there's a lot of advantages to be an individual operator, just making sure everything is like primo, perfect in, in that experience. And so that's, the, that's the big difference we see, is that they typically have lower guest satisfaction, you know, less sort of repeat business sort of stuff. In terms of overall performance, it's a mixed bag. There's terrible, terrible people operating with 30-year-old technology. And there's some great ones that are pretty sophisticated and, you know, doing some smart things. But um, it does give me hope and that there's more individual operators now than there were, you know, a couple years ago as a percentage. Airbnb is investing really heavily into the individual Airbnb host experience. I think they actually promote your properties better on the platform just if you are an individual operator oh, versus really? a property manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so there's a lot of advantages to being an individual owner. So I, I was all about the DIY, you're gonna do it better than anybody else. And that was one of the reasons I wrote the book. And so I still feel like that's that's the way of the future. It's just like, you know, a lot, a millions of people operating, you know, three or five vacation rentals. Like I, I see that as a more likely future than, you know, five or 10 companies, you know, operating, you know, 100,000, you know, properties each. Mm. Just yeah. because the operation at scale is so complicated for verification rentals. So that's, I mean, obviously a very different trend lab, you know, normal businesses who mm -hmm. actually see it go to rather consolidate to a few of the big guys. It's just, you think it'll be democratized to cost I guess, hundreds of thousands or millions, millions of individual operators. Totally. Yeah. That's I think cool. it's already been proven up to this point, right? Like um, Hilton tried to get in the game, Accor tried to get in the game. Marriott took a different tact, which is like, hey, we're going to like have all our Bonvoy members. We're going to send them to your properties, which aren't close to our hotels, just so they have more selection when they want to travel. But nobody's trying to get into the assets. Nobody's trying to manage them personally because every property is different. You know how to clean them. You know, what are the amenities? Where's the where do the coffee cups go? Like it's all different, right? You know, and yeah. so uh, to be able to manage at scale these properties, they haven't been able to efficiently figure it out. And they I don't think they will really i mean who knows 10 years anything can happen but it's not happening anytime soon do you see like uh because you know i know running airbnb or short-term rental you're running a hospitality business um more hands-on than just traditional long-term rental do you see like a standard life cycle for these operators or can they get their system set up and then do pretty well because i mean it's it's an active business from from my perspective and this mm. is someone asking who does not run an airbnb or own one but that's been my perspective it's active, absolutely. And people get totally burnt out from it. And I know I know I did, you know, when okay. I was operating my properties, you know, like I always do I was like super hands on, like scrubbing the toilet hands on, right? And so there's a certain point in time you're like, Okay, cool. I can't yeah. deal with another lockout or mm -hmm. another drunk person like passed out in the hallway. <laughs> right. Like it gets to a point where it becomes problematic. And um, so but is there a real benefit of doing that? Like dialing in all your systems, your processes, and then handing it off? Yeah, not really, right? Because the mm -hmm. property manager is going to have their own process. They're going to have their own cleaners. They're going to have their own maintenance. They're gonna have, so it's, it doesn't really make sense to do it. The only reason to do it is to keep them honest. Say, hey, like I did this and I was doing this versus the market. And so that's my expectation. And I'm going to compensate you on maintaining that sort of level of performance. And so if you go below that, I'm going to pay you less. If you go above that, I'm going to pay you more. And so like there's a way to sort of keep them honest on their performance is, is probably the only reason to do it. And you see like a, a cap or sweet spot often for how many properties an individual operator can actually effectively run? Yeah. If it's a full-time job, I mean, I was doing, yeah, about eight. And I was doing that half. The, I think about 10 is where it starts to become a, a, a multi-person job. Yeah. A 10 and a cleaner, right? If you got 10 properties and you got a good cleaner, um, it's totally possible. Yeah. Hmm. And um, okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit, but um, we've talked a bunch in the studio about institutional investors mm -hmm. um, coming into this space. And um, I think that they may be getting into the short-term rental space as well. And I was curious if you were tracking that and if there's anything that you're doing um, in, in, you know, looking at that, looking at the data and how that's impacting the market. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 
it has been an interesting topic lately um, as these big institutional investors and single family rentals have sort of not been able to figure out how to make enough money lately, right? Mm. And so they're sort of turning their attention to short-term mm. rentals to see a big opportunity there. Yeah. Uh, these companies like Invitation Homes, you know, they have 100,000 yeah. plus single family homes, uh, but yeah. you know, the yields just aren't there anymore, right? They were making sort of crazy returns, you know, like mm. uh, 10% plus yeah. back 10 years ago. Yeah, when they bought and, them at a discount after right. the financial crisis. Totally, yeah. 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 And uh, so mm. now they're like in the fours somewhere and they're just like, that's not, enough, enough right yeah. and so they see short-term rentals as this new opportunity to we as we're calling it bring the yield back uh mm. to single family <laughs> yeah. rental investments and so <laughs> and so it is super interesting lots of uh institutional money getting in the space tr people using our data to figure out how to lend uh how to underwrite new deals how to underwrite even new construction deals saying okay cool mm -hmm. this is what you know if there was a property here is what air dna says they would make yeah um and so it's been cool to be some of that sort of oil that's powering the sort of the short-term rental machine yeah. coming up but it's also scary that you know you know what's the opportunity for us when you know somebody comes with five billion dollars into colorado to go buy some uh, some properties you know like what does that really mean for you know this entrepreneurial you know hustle you know business model that we've developed you know what is that what's the impacts of it well so. i i mean i could take a separate angle on it because if you look at the evolution of how these institutional investors came in after the financial crisis they you know they, they bought it at a discount they just turned it right into a rental and it like you said it's gone really well for about 10 years and if they continue not to be able to get the yield i wonder if there'll be just a mass exodus and it will go totally the other direction and all of these big players like strategic acquisitions or invitational or mm. um, blackstone or any of these guys will just say you know what we're just going to drop this strategy as quickly as we picked it up and then that gives a lot of opportunity for buyers for for investors out there i don't know just kind of taking it on a in it, a different direction i mean it, who knows it, we, it we don't know but um it's interesting that their yields are down so. i just don't know where they've nowhere else to park the money right and so they'd have to have another yeah. you know place to go park another their crisis <laughs> gazillion dollars <laughs> right. uh, which is a hard place to find right now um true but i i mean i would love that outcome it is a sort of a scary outcome where just you know you know well, and, KKR and Blackstone own every every property in like tier two markets around the world. Yeah, right? we were actually trying to figure out if we could determine which properties were institutionally owned and which ones were individually owned. That's that's data that we're currently uh, research. I think we have a bet on that, don't we? As to I think that you're currently that's, researching. Well, I'm currently see researching. Find out. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing if that's something that we can uh, figure out. So it's a win from either way. If I if yeah, I lose I the bet, it's a cheap bet. You know, the worry. And if you win, you get the information. Yeah, so, you get great information. Well, Got so. a good data set for you, so get, get okay. in touch with me. I got yeah. every every property and who owns every property in the U.S. So awesome. Well, you yeah. can probably settle the bet out. then. I could probably help yeah. you out. Yeah. You, you might have a, a secret <laughs> advantage here. Um, <laughs> um, did you want ADUs? Um, yeah, I don't know how much because I know from the you know yeah. your your very high level data. I mean, you're familiar with like you know local markets, even say Denver here. I mean, sure. I know you know accessory dwelling units, ADUs in Denver, yeah. Granny Flats, where we were calling me all around the country. Those have just been a very hot, sexy topic for a number of years for just you know uh, a low cost way to add properties, increase density without building up all this stuff. You got any trends or insight to ADUs and Airbnbs yeah. just in general? ADUs, yeah, super hot, especially in regular, you know, regulatory markets. Heavy regulation, ADUs are crushing it. Um, I'm actually an investor in a company called Yardsworth, which builds ADUs in Los Angeles and puts them on Airbnb. And it's a beautiful business model, sort of solves this sort of like housing crunch, gets mm -hmm. around all the regulatory issues and able to sort of capitalize on the Airbnb market at the same time. So I love it, I mean, but mostly in places where regulation is an issue and where you can get them downtown, you get them by the major events and there's just no other way to add supply besides being creative, like in yeah. like an ADU. Okay. Um, so I like the market. It's not something particularly easy to track, right? It sort of shows up as a studio or one bedroom property and there's nobody sort of saying like, this is an ADU, yeah. Yeah. Right? And it's not really not particularly it. marketable sort of a, part of a, uh, a property. But hey, my, my kids were at a pod for school last year that was ADU in the Highlands and they're showing their numbers with me and it was like, it was crazy what they were making off of a tiny little, uh, I think it was actually a basement unit that they converted, but you know, they're making like $45,000 a year off their, their basement, which is, you know, it's a pretty good chunk of change. Yeah, it's a nice little passive income stream right there. Mm. Um, and did you want to, um, could you maybe talk a little bit about the Rentalizer product? Um, I think that's kind of one of your newest, your newest ventures. 
Cool. So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, so Rentalizer is definitely our our um, it's our hottest product right now. It's just part of our market minder um, platform, and we also just call it the Airbnb calculator. And it's it's pretty simple. Put in an address, and we start to look at all the comps in the areas. Um, and try to figure out like how much that property would earn as a short-term rental. Um, we've seen just like explosive growth of the, over the, on that product. Um, you know, a million people querying that a month at the moment. It's a global product, but probably eighty wow. percent of that mm. is in the in the U.S. And so, um, so that, so I could go in and I could just say, hey, I'm looking at this property on one two three Anyway Street, right? Yep. And I just put it in there and I put in my address and it pops out some like cus- kind of custom data basically for that yep. location as to what it could potentially yep. earn. That's yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Yeah. And there's yeah. definitely like a freemium component. So we'll give you the basic stats. Like what is the revenue going to be average daily rate occupancy rate? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you can sort of upgrade to see like, what are all the comps? You know, how are we getting to that number? What's sort of the monthly seasonality of that market? Yeah. And also get into some cool, like um, Zestimate trend sort of thing. So how's that trending over the last three years? Is it on the in- incline or decline? And, you know, also like just how confident are we about that score? You know, so a lot of people are like, what is this magic? How is this getting here? Yeah. Um, and so we're gonna put a lot more details into like, you know, there's a lot of comps and we feel very confident about yes. the score or like the next similar property is like 27 miles that way. So like, you know. We don't know. <laughs> take it, that's that's do, neat. Do, do, do some research. <laughs> I like that confidence scale a lot. That's a yeah. really cool yeah. add on there. Cause that, that really, um make some really good choices using um air dna so, yeah so we that. you know i think that's yeah. like the future for us is uh in the real estate investing front you know we pull in like what we think that property is worth from a data partner so we can do like an instant like you know cap rate calculator by putting in some assumptions you know and eventually we'll be putting in like what's on the market uh, and doing that sort of more proactively so if you're looking for a property you know in the highlands here in denver you know, we're saying this, how much this would work, this would earn. And we automatically looked at like three other properties locally that we think are going to earn the most money in, mm-hmm. in the marketplace. So just more of a sort of a recommendation engine on like what we think the best properties on the market are. Um, yeah. And then there's just, you know, we have a lot of partners on there and that's why it's so popular is everybody wants to get on our platform. Like we're a property manager. We promote us. We're a lender. We're, you know, we're uh, whoever we, yeah. we do maintenance on the property. And so we do see it as like a, a product that will be free and we'll just sort of monetize it via like partnerships uh, with other mm. people and the vendors out that's, there. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So I have cool. one final question for you, Scott. This is just kind of a, not related to this directly, but I mean, you've been through ups and downs as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, as an investor, I'm sure if you could hop in your time machine, you know, go back 10, 20 years, talk to your younger self, like just what advice would you give yourself, you know, life, business, investing, like what would be like a, a nugget or two? And this is really for my own personal uh, <laughs> knowledge. And I love these end of podcast <laughs> gotchas. Yeah, no, these are these are good. Um, I know that was on the question. prep sheet, so sorry. No, no, it's all good. <laughs> I, you know, being an entrepreneur is so fun, right? So I think you know, just just trusting yourself earlier in your career. I think when I was young, I said like, I got to go get a job and at a corporate America, so I could figure out the world and how it all spins and like do it but the only way you learn that stuff really is just by doing uh, and 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 just sort of taking the risk and so like you know one thing i would have just done is just taking the plunge taking the risk when you don't have as much writing on it because i started to become an entrepreneur my wife was pregnant and it was just a very stressful Mm. (laughs) time to become an entrepreneur and so you sort of put those dreams in the bag you know more likely when you're sort of like i got to pay the bills and so it's just more uh more stressful so you know take the risk when you're, uh, you're you're young and you have less to lose for sure um, and I don't know. I don't know. Nothing, nothing else really comes to mind, really. Um, it's a great one. Yeah. yeah that's a great tip. Yeah. 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 Trust yourself. Yeah. Start early. Yeah. Start early. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Scott, thank you so much. I mean, this has been uh, a wealth of knowledge. Of course, our listeners can go to airdna.co or just Google it. You guys pop up in a lot of, you know, a lot of search results. Um, but just thank you so much, man. We appreciate your time, your knowledge and just taking part of your day with us. It's been great to be here. Thanks for the invite, everybody. Thanks, Scott. Yeah.